Um, first of all, thank you for all being here on the cold um, Saturday afternoon. Um, I want to thank all the people and certainly um, Mr. Nagul Durrani for inviting me here for a very unusual um, topic today, um, the global allied Muslim contribution in the First World War. And um, I, I mentioned the topic, the unbearable lightness of that contribution, and I will try, try to explain you. Um, do not expect um, a very academic uh, presentation with about military uh, battles, about politics, about the aftermath of Six Pico. And we are focused on the human aspects of, 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 of these people. Um, and, and I will try to explain you why it's important that we remember these people and the personal emotions between all these people of all faith and, and none. Um, but to give it in a context, um, I have to give you some data about the project. So, um, first of all, I'm not a historian. It may be, sound strange, but um, I'm a researcher. So I do research, and what I try to do with my team is finding everything um, and put it in the book. So it's always very rare for a lot of people. Um, and what we are not, we are not a, an organization uh, supported by any government. We don't accept any money from them because we want to be totally independent. We have a headquarters in, the, in, in London since uh, four years now. We are no army recruiting department, um, so we are not promoting um, empires or battles. Um, we just focus on human aspects um, also across borders and religious, so we're also not set up by any religion organization. Um, we're completely independent. Okay, so what did we do in, in, in all these years? Six years ago, we started with the foundation that I created, the Forgotten Heroes Foundation. And um, we located approximately 850,000 documents worldwide. So in um, of the beaten track, so what we did, we traveled around in 19 countries and we went out to look for personal letters and testimonies of all these soldiers, mainly Muslims. Where did they come from? Um, how did they experience that war? How did they arrive over there? How did they back up? What was their relationship? And um, so most of these documents are not in traditional um, archives. Because when I started this project, there was nothing talking about the human aspects about these soldiers. It was all about strategy and politics. So um, I spent two days um, talking with Eugene Rogan, who is a, a very important academic at Oxford University uh, from the Middle East Center. And he explained to me that nobody really cared about personal stories about these humans in the trenches. And uh, he was right, because most of the documents we found in private collections or with individuals, the diaspora, we found in organizations who send out doctors and nurses. So all these documents we, we, we traced were not found in uh, the traditional libraries or uh, universities, but in very small um, community centers, halls, um, hospitals, uh, private collections, um, container parks, um, everywhere you wouldn't expect them. And um, because we refuse money from the government, struggling for funding is, is always a topic, so we only have been able to read 7% approximately of the 850,000 documents we discovered. So what we put in the book is approximately 2% of what we found, but there's still so much more out there. Um, People sometimes think, oh, we know everything about World War I. There's been commemoration going on for five years. Um, and we have been presenting the, these figures about the Allied powers, the Central powers, things like this. Uh, but for five years, I've been invited to commemorations, um, academic lectures, seminars, and have been seeing always the same people. And say so we are not reaching the grassroots community with very powerful stories and to learn from it. 
Uh, I see the same military people, the same politicians, the same academics, but where are the school kids, where are the schools, where are the small communities? They should be here and not the same top level. And because I was repeating that, it was um, the Armed Forces Charity who did um, a survey among 2,000 British um, young people from 14 years old to 23 years old. And of these 2,000 people, um, the results were really astonishing in a negative sense. After five years commemoration, I think um, whole Europe spent something of 1.2 billion euros on commemoration events and um, asked to these 2,000 young people between 14 and 23 years old what the bloodiest battle was in the First World War I. Um, 16% said Pearl Harbor, which is of the Second World War. Um, 8% was convinced it was Independence Day, the bloodiest battle. 7% thought it was the Battle of Hastings. And believe it or not, but it's in the survey. It's an, really, it's, it's a series of, it's done by the British Armed Forces. 5% thought it was the Battle of Helm's Deep, which is a battle in the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings. 50% um, of these 2,000 young people was convinced Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister in World War I. 10% thought it was Margaret Thatcher. 20% thought we were fighting against the French. And 6% thought that the killing of John F. Kennedy was the reason the First World War started. Now this is really shocking after five years of commemoration, communication, spending years, a lot of money, but we haven't reached the target. And it makes me sad because it means we could learn so much reaching out to each other, communities, telling stories, and we haven't done that. And this is why um, it motivates me to keep going on with this book with, and, and not giving up and going to um, small communities. And I'm very happy I'm in the mosque because um, there you have a covering of all um, ages and, 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 and people who are all part of another community who can talk about it and say we, need, we really need to look into the First World War. In Britain, um, less than 4% of the British school children have an idea that 400,000 of the 1.5 million soldiers from India were Muslim. And nobody has any clue about the total number. When we started our research, the French were talking about 150 Muslims about the North African colonies and Britain was talking about, and keep talking about, the 400,000 Muslims from their colonies. Now after six years, we can prove, and we are very careful on what we put on paper, we are at the figure for the moment that four and a half million Muslims contributed in the First World War with the Allied forces. Four and a half million Muslims, nobody's talking about. I'm talking about not only the Indian, Muslims undivided India from Pakistan, Bangladesh. It's very confusing keeping talking about India. It's undivided India. Uh, but there were one million uh, Muslims from Egypt. There were one and a half million Muslims in the Russian army. There were 85,000 Muslims in the Chinese labor corps. There were even 5,000 Muslims in the American forces. Um, there were 400,000 Muslims in the African forces, Somaliland, Nigeria, Togo, Tanzania, South Africa, we don't talk about it. But they fought with the Allied forces and it made me think, how can you say to young Muslims you don't belong here if four and a half million Muslims contributed to the freedom of Europe? How can you deny it? It makes Muslim stakeholders in European history and we should all know that and we should teach that in schools, I think. So people will have a better understanding that Muslims, they sacrifice their lives for a war. None of their making is also very important. They had no deal in that war, in the First World War. It was a war in Europe. It was a war 
um, a useless war. Every historian agrees that the First World War was a war for borders and minerals and egos, very similar as the time we are in now. It was not like the Second World War that we were fighting against an evil ideology about fascism. The First World War was a waste of lives. It was all about egos. But still, they were there. The title went our lives, I got some emails why I was calling this the unbearable lightness. And um, I was not referring to a book of Mila Kundera, but sometimes um, I like to invite people um, not what to think, but how to think. The unbearable lightness, I make a reference um, to academics, uh, to um, a theory about the German philosopher Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche, who um, say that our eternal life is returning all the time and that makes it light. And uh, he agreed with Parmenides, a Greek philosopher of the five, fifth century, who shared the same thing, but he said that this lightness was unbearable. And I tried to make a connection with the stories of these Muslims who were in the trenches in Europe, in Mesopotamia, in Africa, that the fact that they are whitewashed, that they're not being talked about, that their legacy is not being remembered, make it not light, but make it very unbearable. And this is what, when I'm giving lectures to academics, I try to make them think and say, look, this is what you're missing. Learn from philosophy and try to understand what we are missing today by not uh, recognizing the contribution of these people. So what I will do, I will highlight two pages of the book. Um, uh, to, uh, to explain some, some things. Um, you must remember that these people from undivided India and um, North Africa, for the officers here in, 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 in Europe, um, they were not really cannon fodder, but they were just weapons. Um, most of them were illiterate. Uh, very few could read of them, but when we went to official records from these officers and these personal letters they were writing home, um, they learned so much of these people, and I will highlight some of, of, of these amazing stories. Um, in 1914, there was no convention of Geneva, it's in 14, so what happened, um, on the, on, on, on the battlefield when there was no time or there was no space, um, uh, prisoners of war were shot by French and, and British officers on the spot. Nobody made any remarks on that because it happened. There was no convention of Geneva. So these officers, um, they were really surprised that these, what they called illiterate people from North Africa and undivided India, like over here. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. So like over here, um, it's contradicting everything what, what we see today. They noticed that Muslim soldiers were nursing wounded German soldiers on the battlefield when they started to talk with them and said, why are you doing this? He said, well, it's in no fate. For them, it was something, they're illiterate. You know, they come from the mountains, they are wild people, and they are nursing and helping German soldiers on the battlefield. Um, Another thing they report in their records that they say, you won't believe these Muslims from these countries. We have to promise them not to shoot the prisoners of war before they want to hand them over to us. And they are really lecturing as they say, look, we will not hand these prisoners of war over to you until you promise that you will not put them in cages. They should not beg for their substance. You will not torture them. Now, if you type in the words Muslim and war on Google, you find nothing else of atrocities, nothing about how they really are. So these French and Canadian and British officers were asking, why should we do this? 
there are your enemies, there are our enemies that are using chemical weapons, they're killing you. This is the enemy. And they were referring to the Hadith. And these officers are writing there and they report what is the Hadith, what are they referring to because they are they were illiterate about Islam. Now if you tell that to young non-Muslims, it's difficult for them to believe that there was a time that Muslims were lecturing civilized British soldiers about the fact that they should not shoot their prisoners of war on the spot, not torture them, they should feed them, treat them as human beings. It's a total contradiction in the mainstream media, and this is why I think it's important to tell these stories and use these documents. Another aspect is, you see, these are, these are German soldiers being guarded by um, Spahis, soldiers from Algeria, um, Muslim soldiers. And I was fascinated, why are they using Muslim soldiers to guard German prisoners of war? And there were two reasons for that. First of all, the Germans were very afraid about these Muslims. They cultivated their image of fierce war and that they should kill them if they tried to escape, which was their right. But after a while, the military top officers, they started to understand these Muslims and their hadith about how they took care about prisoners of war. And there were a few incidents that the local people in France, in France launched massive attacks and lynched German prisoners of war on the street. And the French and British soldiers did not intervene. They didn't want to shoot at these French civilians who were attacking these German prisoners of war because they committed atrocities. But they knew that these Muslims would not tolerate this. And they knew that the French people was also very scared about these soldiers from North Africa. And that they say, well, what will they do? And they knew they would not allow them to harm these prisoners of war. And this is why of one of the reasons they're starting to use Muslims to protect German prisoners of war against the anger of the French people. It doesn't fit in the narrative today, but with, with everything that we see on, on social media, but it tells a lot about um, the integrity of these people, that um, even far away from home, they stood their ground, they practiced their religion, and they did not make a compromise on that. And in the many stories we found in the book is that these Muslims, not only in, in, in Europe, but also in Russia, in Mesopotamia, in North Africa, they earned the respect because they integrated perfectly in the armed forces, but they did not assimilate. And that's very important to understand. They got the respect of all these French, Belgian, Canadian, American soldiers because they stood their ground on their faith. They didn't compromise on this. And it is a dialogue we should um, refer to. You can integrate today in any community, but you should never to, to be asked to abandon everything you're standing for and, uh, and your heritage and your creed. You should not assimilate because then you're losing everything you are. And they didn't do that. They said, look, this is, first of all, this is not a war, but we promise to fight with you for many reasons, diff different reasons, but we will not assimilate and we will not behave <coughs> like you are acting. And this is why you got this huge respect from. And one of the um, ultimate proofs that we had to look for was the more we were tell telling and finding these stories about, do you know how much respect this was between these soldiers of all faith and non and, and Muslims. A lot of researchers and academics and historians they said it's a fairy tale, you know, it's made up, you know, it's like a Hollywood movie. Yes, there were some um, cases that there was brotherhood between Muslims and non-Muslims and Sikhs and Hindu and Jews. 
because they were fighting a lot of Jews with Muslims who came from Algeria and Morocco, and there was no issue. We didn't find any incident report between Jews and, and Muslims. They were just in the same trenches fighting the same enemy. And um, I knew before I can make a statement, I'm going to need something solid. I, I need some documents that prove that these stories are not exceptional, but it was mainstream. And um, I'm Belgium, I'm stubborn. Belgians are stubborn. This is why we already are in trouble, I think. Um, and then we found these reports from French officers that say, look, very fast after the war, only in, in July, August, that they say, look, French and, and, and Belgian and even Canadian soldiers are asking for instructions what to do when Muslims are wounded or dying on the battlefield because there were not enough imams. And even that the chapels and rabbis were running around with Qurans and giving the last writs. The slaughter was so huge that they, they couldn't follow up on that. So I talked with some people and said, it's a fairy tale, you know, it's not. But then we found this official letter in the, very, in the basement, in a small box in Lyon, in the local archive of the uh, French Minister of War, Millerand. And he wrote this letter, and we put it in the book. We have the original. Uh, if the far right finds it, they would burn it, because it proves that all these stories are genuine. And he was under so much pressure of these officers who said, look, we need instructions. Soldiers are getting angry that they cannot comfort, comfort Muslims, their brother in arms who are dying. They don't speak Arabic or Urdu, and they have no clue what Islam is, but they need to know. And already in that time, France, it's a secular. Secularism is in the constitution. But because there were more and more complaints and letters arriving on his desk, he took this step in December to write um, an instruction. It's, it's, it's an order, it's not an, an advice. People have to comply with it, he's a minister of war. So he was reaching the constitution by writing this letter. And it's really amazing. He's explaining in that letter how to bury a Muslim on the battlefield or when they have time not in a coffin, but wash them and put them in white cotton and bury them in the direction of Mecca. This is already astonishing. You know, you're in the battlefield, but instead you're asking it, okay, I'm going to tell you what you have to do. You have no choice, you really have to do. But um, what's really unbelievable, and when I, the first time I mentioned it, they say, no, you're making this up is he explains in the letter and he says, look, when a Muslim is about to die, he will always try to pronounce the confirmation of his faith, the Shahada. Now, if he's not able to do so, you have to say it on his behalf. So, he's French, First World War, and he's instruction, giving an instruction to um, Christians, Jews, Sikh, and say, these are the words you have to say. You have to say, I bear witness that there is only one God, Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his prophet and the messenger of Allah. And they complied with it. Can you imagine they complied with it and the pressure was gone? So you have on the battlefield soldiers, they know softies, they are very hard and trained men in a very awful war. And they are pronouncing the Shahada on behalf of Muslims who are dying on the battlefield to comfort them. And you can see these reports following up that they were pleased they could do so. And Muslims were unbelievably flattered that Christians and Jews would not abandon them and would help them in pronouncing the Shahada on the battlefield. So my question is, if this was not an issue then, what is all the problems of today? Why are we making such a big fuss 
about everything on faith, on Islam. If these people were putting the Minister of War under pressure to receive instructions, to be taught the elements, the essence, how can I comfort my Muslim brother in arm on the battlefield? And that they did it. A lot of people of non-Muslim schools or, or communities ask, are asking me this. Um, when they pronounced it, did, it, did they become Muslim? I said, no, they didn't become Muslim. There's no danger into pronouncing this because the intention is not there. But it, it proves how many um, ignorance is there about Islam. And you think a lot of people know, but they don't know it. And I was just telling, um, I was invited um, two years ago at Harvard University. I thought it was a joke, you know, being invited on, on this project. And, and these people are very intelligent, you know, I'm an idiot compared with them. So I'm, I'm starting a, a presentation about these 250 academics and uh, the moderator is cutting me down after 10 minutes and say, oh, this is a bad start, you know, this is not going well at all. And then he's asking me, look, I'm getting WhatsApp messages. Quite some people in the room don't understand what you mean with Abrahamic faith. I couldn't believe it. I said, how can you be in Harvard University? How do you speak with Muslims if you don't know we share the same book? So when I told them that Maria is mentioned more times in the Quran than in the Bible, they got berserk. They said, no, this is impossible. Why should it? They said, do you know Jesus is also a prophet? No. So when you speak with non-Muslims, don't think they know. They don't know. They don't know that we share Abraham and Moses and Isaac. Have no idea. So you start the dialogue and you're telling your story and you think they know. But in their mind, they think you're making this up. This is a fairy tale. So you have no conversation. And this is why these stories about these soldiers is important to tell and make sure this is not a fairy tale. We have the original documents. So could we reflect on that? And instead of talking about the technical aspects of the Battle of the Somme and Verdun, could we talk about what happened over there? And the human aspect of our soldiers, how they reached out to each other, how they were creating bridges. And it must strengthen Muslims. Muslims need to know that they say, look, if it was not a problem from your grandfather to complain to his officer that he has no idea how to comfort his Muslim brother in arms, why should it be a problem today that they are building a new mosque or they want to have Islam being integrated in traditional schools? These were the people that were begging for it. So this is why I think it's important to learn from the First World War and about these stories. So the whole book is nothing else than one story, another story, showing that there was so much respect between all these people of all faith and none, and try to think, where did we lose this? Open the debate, where did it go wrong? Where is it so difficult to, don't, we don't see human beings anymore. We see how they are dressed, if they are wearing a headscarf, if they are praying in another way. So, this is what is, um, the, the whole project is about. So, in northern France, you have these thousands and thousands of Muslim terms of soldiers who um, died on the battlefield. And I will end with one last story. When I visited them, I noticed that between some of these tombs, there was a cross and nobody could explain me um, why is there a cross. And some say it's a Muslim who converted to Christianity, it's a mistake. But then we found these records about um, Muslims who were asking for a chapel non-Muslims, French, Canadian, and they knew they were going to die in this field hospital. And their last request to these chapels was, look, I've been fighting with these Muslims, my Muslim brother in arms. Is it okay if I would be buried with them? 
because I really would like to stay with them. And the chapel said, of course you can. Of course you can be buried with your Muslim brother in arms. So instead of telling people, I don't know, you should share that story and try to imagine. I don't know, you found some letters and reports from nurses and doctors and chapels. What does motivate a soldier who is dying and his last thought is, I want to be buried with my Muslim brother in arms. Please don't separate me after so many months. Don't bury me with the Christians, I want to stay with them. It's something to think about. As I told you, we only have discovered 7% of these documents, and I hope to find out what motivated these people to make such a decision at the last time, knowing that he would be to die. I'm sure we could learn a lot of that. It could build new bridges of mutual understanding by going in the past. And we don't touch that, and I don't want to explain it as long as I don't have an explanation. This is why I keep to my position as a researcher. I just copy and paste the letter in the book, and I say, let's think about it. <clears throat> what, could be, what could generate these people to do that? But there must be an enormous amount of um, respect about admiration before you, you, you decide to do this and say, look, I'm just going to die here anyway. I want to be buried with, with, with them. Crossing in 1914, um, things that we, 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 we wouldn't believe anymore today. So their legacy, if we want to avoid that they become ghosts, which the far right would like to be, that their legacy is disappearing, we really must do everything possible to safeguard these documents, uh, digitize them, put them on, social, on, on the internet, um, uh, invite students and, 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 and teachers to translate them because these documents I had a team who could read Arabic and Urdu and Farsi and Swahili and French and Latin. Now there's a huge amount of personal letters in boxes fading away um, and, and, and time is not on our side. We see now that in, 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 in Greece and in uh, France, when people find these documents, they destroy them because they don't want them to get out because these stories contradict all the stories they are spreading that Muslims is negative, that it's evil, that it's bad. They have never been there. And um, beside this, um, in our research, a huge amount already has been destroyed in, 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 in the wars. And I've, I've made a list in 1914, in the Second World War, with the German invasion, um, 900,000 manuscripts and books were destroyed in the library of Leuven in Belgium. Um, also in the Second World War, in the library of Belgrado, a half a million of volumes uh, of books, 4,000 journals and 1,800 newspaper articles about the First World War were destroyed. In the Oriental Institute in Sarajevo in 1992, during the siege of Sarajevo, manuscripts, one of the richest collection um, that included Thousands of documents about the First World War in Mesopotamia were destroyed. In 1992, members of the um, Armed Repub Republican of Serbian National Army destroyed the library of the university in Bosnia, um, including hundreds of thousands of documents about Muslims who fought in the First World War in the Balkan. Um, in Baghdad, in 2003, um, 27,000 documents with correspondence about the Arab revolt were destroyed. Um, in December 2011, in Egypt, 200,000 volumes about the Egyptian contribution in World War I were destroyed. In February 2014, the National Archives of Bosnia has Herzegovina were burned, burned to the ground by extreme right Serbs, erasing um, 250,000 documents of the Muslim contribution in World War I and World War II. And in 2014, in Iraq, the library of Mosul 
and the um, university and national library of Anbar were completely destroyed by Daesh and it was containing an enormous amount of the Muslim contribution in Mesopotamia in World War I and II. All these documents are gone. All these legacies are gone. We will never be able to know what, what it was about, about the testimonies, about mutual respect, about the contribution, about how much we own the Muslim worldwide. All this is all gone, so we only found after six years 850,000, which is nothing. If you know that four and a half million Muslims, sons of, fathers of, rode home. They made a testimony, their records were. So 850,000 is nothing. They must, I hope them is much more, but nobody cares. So, um, and then you see this is just the huge amount that already has been destroyed. So this is why um, we, 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 we invite people uh, ask people, invite our, our exhibition, Singularity of Peace, we call it, in, in Hammersmith, um, because we have so much more to tell. We, um, we offer tea and coffee and snacks and, and sweets, making, um, trying to get, create converse, conversations, uh, answering questions of people, so we take time for that. Uh, we already have some um, organizations who organize events, and um, it's difficult, I know, for a lot of Muslims, um, they say, why don't we know? Why, does, why isn't it on the internet? They say, but we just started, six years is nothing. Me and my partner, she's the most crazy woman in the world, we traveled for six years in, in all these countries, in 19 years, spending weeks and months in filthy basements and attics trying to find these documents. So. Um, we explain that story and, and try to convince that we need support. We need uh, to get it on the surface because I believe it's an antidote against the negative Main Street against, against Muslims because we are focused on, on identities. Who was it person from Kashmir, from Baluchistan? Who was that person from Somali? Who was that person from Nigeria? What's his story? By doing that, we, we're putting a face on these four and a half million Muslims, and we are moving away about these continuous efforts to raise away your identity, to fade you away, because it is what is happening now. And the Jews in now, we have support from Jews. I think the first donation we got was from Antwerp, Jews in Antwerp, who said, look, we recognize what's happening. It's dehumanizing Muslims taking away their identity. If they succeed, it's so easy to kill them, to banish them. It's happened with the Jews. Now the same thing is always so happening. Take away their identity, assimilate them in your social environment. But it doesn't give you respect and the proof is with these soldiers and laborers of the First World War. They earn respect of these people because they stood their ground. They performed their prayers five times a day. In the book, I mentioned that the first day, all these Western soldiers, they, were, they couldn't believe that these guys were performing the Ramadan. It's a, it's a war. The Germans, they don't need to kill you, you're gonna die of starvation. But after a few days, they were collecting all the food they had to give it to these Muslims when they were breaking fast. Nobody asked them to do that. So you see, this is when you get respect because you stand, you go, this is what you are. We have this beautiful letter of a Canadian officer who's writing to his woman at home, and he says, look, I'm, 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 I'm a Catholic. I am go to the church on Sunday, and then I go to the pub. But I learn here from these Muslims that they are Muslim when they fight, when they sleep, when they eat. It's what they are. You can't take it out of them. And I wonder if we had used that letter of this Canadian officer in schools, the last five years, how would the world look like? Because he understood what it's all about. Um, and it's what we invite people to um, our exhibition and, and, and then say, look, it gets in the dialogue if you have questions, answers, and we tell a lot more of these stories. And also with the book. It's very good book, so the book is not funded. Fear and me, we have a, a loan. <laughs> we have a mortgage on our house to fund it because nobody was ready to give us money to publish the book. In the way, of, well, I wanted to have a coffee table book. I wanted to have a book that people can have a look at and young people and say, 
what's all this about? I didn't want to have an academic book, very difficult with details, but just beautiful presented. I tell, look, you need to know first that they were right there. I have a lot of historians who have contacted me and said, I have no idea, but we have um, checked your book, we have scrutinized it, and you did not exaggerate a single thing. You didn't make one thing up. But it's unbelievable that we, we didn't look in that direction. We've never looked from the human side. We've always been looking from politics and military strategies. So um, the book has been scrutinized by Cambridge, Oxford University, Harvard. I was invited at the Mass Igna Convention in Chicago in December. Um, so I got a lot of critics, and he said, we checked it out, it's great. Even Daily Mail has bought the book. They didn't come back to me, they didn't write an article about it, most probably because they couldn't find a lie or whatever. If I had made a mistake, they would most probably blow it up and say it's all fake news. So this is what we try and say, look, the only way we have now is um, support is with buying the book, give it to your non-Muslim neighbor, educate him, give him the book and say, it's, we're not attacking, we're not moaning, we're not, it's not a book against the Egyptian um, um, British Empire or French Empire. It's not, look how um, we have been mistreated or whatever. It's just, no, they were there, they fought with honor and dignity. And everything that happened past, we know. But learn, this, learn the story. It's, it's not blame, it's not a blame game, but you should know, it could help. So this is um, what we're trying to do with events like this, motivate people to talk about it, visitors, um, <coughs> convince people to give it to the, we have a lot of school kids from schools who come to the book. The book has been approved by the Department of Education. Um, Offset has approved it. They're trying now to integrate it in the curriculum, but there's no funding, there's no money. So we're looking for funding to say, we have a list of 400 schools begging for the book, but there's no, Funding. So we try to convince rich people, rich Muslims, but they have no time to listen for they have all the priorities. So we have to go to the grassroots community and say, look, you can help us, you can become our ambassadors, because I really believe if, if we can save one human life because of a person that has been reading that book, then this is the biggest tribute we can do to these four and a half million Muslim soldiers who fought with the Allied forces, then they did not die in vain. They died in vain in the First World War. It was, a, it was nothing to gain. But if we can save one life by telling about their story and their sacrifice, then they did not die in vain. And this is what I really believe in. So um, thank you so much for listening and, 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 and coming here, spending your Saturday afternoon listening to me, and I really um, hope you enjoyed it. And after the tea and coffee, I'm here for some questions. I hope I can answer them. Thank you so much. <laughs>